Many will immediately assume that the nuance I'm about to present in this video is one that parrots the anti-drug war talking point that addiction is more broad than just physical substances that one buys on the black market, but also about the legal products with less societal shame attached to them, such as alcohol, cigarettes, and especially social media. This is only a fraction of the new perspective I want to present when I say that the human brain is an addiction machine. By no means is this meant to be prescriptive or medical. What I'm offering here is an alternative conceptualization of the word addiction that might help encourage you to take a different approach in the pursuit of a healthier mind. To explain this conceptualization, I want you to think of the word addiction similarly to the word consequence. When most people say the word consequence, they mean it to imply punishment for a negative action. The consequence of their actions is supposed to be a neutral phrase, since consequence just means the aftermath of one's behaviors. But when hearing that, you might very well assume it implies a negative consequence. When you see someone doing a good deed, you don't tell them that there are consequences for their actions, but instead rewards for their actions. Addiction is a word used in a similar fashion to consequence, because its pure definition is neutral in meaning, but colloquially it's used in a negative context. Just as there are both negative and positive consequences, there are negative and positive addictions. A meaningful hobby is a common positive addiction. Let me use myself as an example. I'm a writer, obviously, and this hobby gives my life a sense of meaning. I feel like I can best express my thoughts through this medium and, because of my level of skill, share profound ideas with it. As I mentioned briefly in my video on disability as a spectrum, I felt threatened by disability and the chance that it could rob me of this ability to continue the hobby, and how that anxiety alone made me realize I would feel suicidal if I was forced by disability to live without this hobby. Your average person might call that a tragedy, but I would call this a withdrawal symptom. My hobby for writing is a healthy addiction. I know that I cannot live without it. But alas, it gives my life great meaning, and my interactions with this hobby improve my mental health. I'm not going to quit it just because its absence risks severe withdrawal symptoms. There's nothing wrong with looking at hobbies through the addiction mindset. In fact, it could be argued that this way of thinking can be utilized to form more healthy hobbies. While this isn't true for everything, one pattern many are conscious of with addictions is that unhealthier ones can feel easier to form, while healthier ones are harder to form. Getting addicted to sugar is much easier than getting addicted to consistent exercise. The sweets are always kept within reach and seen as a way to treat yourself. Meanwhile, going out for daily walks can feel inaccessible and a chore. However, and this isn't a new idea, many articles have been written about this life hack, a person can flip the way they perceive both of these conditions to change the behaviors they gravitate towards. Stop stocking sweets around the house to make them hard to access and a chore to indulge in. Meanwhile, start thinking about treating yourself to a nice afternoon walk and make such a healthy activity more accessible by having music and proper walking shoes ready to go at all times. The articles that write about this lay out the technique, but they don't note what way of thinking from which this process is derived, and by looking at addiction as a neutral word for repetitive behaviors, we've found the origin of this life hack. With this lens, we can see what makes negative addictions pervasive and positive ones so difficult, and start ascribing the difficulties, inaccessibility and pain, to negative addictions and the rewarding qualities, treating oneself and ease of access, to positive addictions. Playful language helps us think in new ways. While fascism is a word that's usually used to refer to oppressive and authoritarian governments, at one point in American culture it was used jokingly to refer to control freaks at home or in the workplace. Jim is so uptight about making sure our breaks are 15 minutes to the second. What a fascist. This is not simply playful language, but an opening to understand fascism to mean something more than just a large general system, but rather one that also affects smaller organizations in your life, such as the workplace. Carrie's such an avid cyclist, she's practically addicted to her bicycle. This too, while being a playful use of the word addiction, also opens up the door to understanding this habit as an addiction that you wish to entice yourself into similarly to the person you're directing this playful language towards. Applying this new definition of addiction isn't just for controlling the activities and thoughts we gravitate towards either. It can also be used to have more control of where we get our addictions from and to source them from healthier places. 
I've heard time and time again that oppressive systems want us to feel tired, sad, paranoid, and angry all the time, because these emotions are ones that can be easily abused to control us and make us more profitable, and that feeling happy or devoid of these negative emotions is itself a revolutionary act. While I don't disagree with this sentiment, it can sometimes be misinterpreted in practice to manifest itself as revolutionary forced optimism. For some people, the takeaway might be that if you feel negative emotions, it's evidence that you're weak and letting oppressive forces win. They're viewing the negative side of the coin, bad emotions are evidence that authoritarians have won over me, than the positive side, I should relish happiness more because it's not within my oppressor's best interests. How do we encourage people to avoid hurting themselves by looking at the negative side of this coin? Well, we look at emotions, all of them, as addictions that we cannot live without and the sources of those emotions as our dealers. Happiness is not a permanent state. Maybe different forms of it, such as contentment, can be, but not happiness is something you feel in the moment. You're always going to feel emotions like sadness, anger, and embarrassment. But instead of being the naive person who feels such intense emotion for the first time, who wishes to structure a life in which they never feel it again, it's healthier to firstly recognize them as feelings that we will get better at overcoming with experience, and secondly, to source them from environments we have more control over. What do I mean by this? A person who engages in revolutionary happiness is not deciding that negative emotions are evil fascist amalgamations that they must quit cold turkey, but rather that the negative emotions we are addicted to shouldn't be sourced from dealers such as capitalists or fascists. These are people who want less of their sadness to be sourced from doomer communities and unhealthy amounts of bad news, and for more of it to be sourced from down-to-earth problems like a day that didn't go as planned or a week where you didn't talk to your friends as much as you used to. By allowing your sadness to come from a different dealer, you're sourcing it from environments you have more control over. There's not much people can tell you that will make constant depressing news articles feel less saddening, but those same people are more likely to have advice to help you plan your days better or cope with loneliness. All we are doing by getting our negative emotions from better sources is receiving a cleaner product. Yes, it's still sadness, but it doesn't have any of that fascist black tar in it that street sadness does. It's going to feel similar, no doubt, but it will harm you much less in the process. It's harm reduction. On the note of harm reduction, therapists these days have a difficult time helping young people who are deathly anxious about totally legitimate problems like climate change and American fascism, and they feel as if there's not much they can really tell these clients. I think one of the best antidotes to this emotional poison is an internet saying that really stuck with me. You know what's worse than fascism? Dead plants and fascism. What this saying means is that while we feel we don't have a lot of control over these ominous issues, at the moment, we're not going to feel any better about it if we let them bog us down to the extent that we neglect to take care of ourselves. To put it bluntly, the only thing worse than your anxieties about fascism is letting those anxieties keep you from watering your plants, resulting in a worse place than you were before even if ever so slightly. Just because you're in a hole doesn't mean you have to keep digging. So, what is addiction in this context? It's the mind chasing things and getting hooked on them. Good things, bad things, healthy hobbies and harmful obsessions, stretches in the morning and chewing on your nails, eating too much sugar and doing daily exercise, sourcing your sadness from too much of the news and sourcing it from day-to-day -day happenings. It's the machinery that ticks away at the behavioral cycles of your life, and taking grasp of it is an important discipline.